Well, here we are in our last lecture of this module, this chapter, and we're picking up where we left off. Remember, where we left off was glycolysis, and we ended up with pyruvate. And we said, well, if there wasn't enough oxygen, it would undergo fermentation, and, and uh, then we'd produce lactate, and along with that, muscle acidosis would occur. Now, mind you, uh, in this case, uh, I am referring to muscles. And I'm using muscles as my example. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. The primary one is, once again, this is a biology class for, uh, for fitness professionals. Uh, so I'm going to continue using muscles as my example. But as we go into this next area right here, when we talk about taking pyruvate and actually taking as much energy out of it as we can and using oxygen to do so, that really happens in virtually all cells of your body. It's the primary way of actually getting uh, uh, getting energy for your body's cells. So we're talking about oxidative phosphorylation. We're talking about cellular respiration. We're talking about aerobic oxidation. You'll hear all these different terms and they're pretty much all interrelated, meaning more or less the same thing or components of this whole system here. But what does it really mean? It's like a fire inside us that fuels us. And I kind of made this reference once before and I don't like reading straight off the PowerPoint, but I'm going to here. Because I want you, I want to read you this quote. In general, respiration is nothing but a slow combustion of carbon and hydrogen, which is entirely similar to that which occurs in a lighted lamp or candle. And that, from this point of view, animals that respire are true combustible bodies that burn and consume themselves. Antoine Lavoisier, 1789. So think about it for a second. Combustion. Think of the word combustion. Really? We think combustion, you think fire, you think explosions. Is it really combustion? Actually, yes. Really. Uh, it truly is from a chemistry standpoint. Looking at it from a purely chemistry standpoint, it truly is combustion. Um, it, it's the burning of food through oxidation with O2. And now uh, that may seem a little redundant, but truly, once again, when we talk about the term oxidation, what we're talking about is losing electrons. So I'm going to say loss of electrons. Um, and that typically happens with oxygen. Not always though, so hence the name oxidation came from O2. But in reality we can oxidize things many other ways. Whenever you oxidize one thing, something else is reduced. Really what we're doing is we're following the electrons because the energy is being carried in these high potential electrons. And uh, so that's one thing that you need to kind of think about is to think energy, think electrons. So let me back up. So the burning of food, oh wait a minute, food, wait a minute, food. What, what was our food? Oh yeah, our carbs, right? Lipids, fats, and our protein. And what did we see? when we look at uh, the molecular formulas here, we saw a whole bunch of carbons and hydrogens. We saw other things too. We saw some oxygens, we saw some um, amine groups, so we saw some nitrogens, but really the backbone is carbon and hydrogen, just like wood, just like that lighted candle. So, right, that's, that's made of a lipid. So, same way, we're burning it, if you will, with oxygen to produce energy. Same as burning wood to make a fire or gasoline combustion to power a car. Think about what we put in our car. We put in octane, oct, eight. This is octane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with hydrogens. Each one of these lines are now represent a hydrogen all around it. That's octane. In the same way, just like your gas needs oxygen to get to it, to, in order to, to create the little explosion to make your car go. Same way here, we need oxygen. Think about it. What if a fire does not get enough oxygen or doesn't get oxygen at all? It gets snuffed out. What happens if we don't get enough oxygen to the working muscles? The same thing. The muscles, muscles become anaerobic. They can keep going for a little while, but they start emphasizing fermentation, they start emphasizing the creation of lactate, and along with that is muscle acidosis. Work eventually stops. What's the point here? This is our primary energy system for all the cells in our body, and specifically with 
with muscles is dominant during rest and lower intensity long duration activities long endurance events like triathlons or marathons so for for fitness and for performance one of our goals should be to maximize the efficiency of this aerobic system how can we do this we have to optimize the way our body takes in and I'm going to add another little word here it takes in and I'm going to put delivers and utilizes oxygen so takes in delivers and utilizes so remember we ended up with pyruvate that's where we ended up at the end of glycolysis we ended up with two pyruvates and that's important and remember pyruvate was a three carbon molecule so there's three stages here stage one is pyruvate decarboxylation well decarboxylation well I'm taking away D to take away some carboxylation you know what that sounds like to me that I'm going to take away carbon dioxide and that's exactly what's going to happen where is this going to happen at? Well, for that, I need you to go back in your mind, go back in history, and remember junior high. Do you remember your junior high science teacher teaching you the basics of biology? And he would remember the guy who wore a lab coat, even though he never worked in a lab in his life? And he would say something like, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Well, he's exactly right, because that's where this happens. This is where we get the vast majority of our energy, the vast majority of our ATP in our bodies that happens in that mitochondria, that powerhouse of the cell. So pyruvate is transported through the outer mitochondrial membrane. So let's look at this mitochondria. We kind of already talked about it a little bit when we talked about um, organelles. And we can see that the mitochondria has both this outer membrane and a convoluted inner membrane. All right, and that's really important. So inside this inner membrane, we have the matrix. We can see that all through here. And in between the two, in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, like right in here, we have what's known as the intermembrane space. Now, What's going to happen, where we're going to get our energy in this mitochondria is all going to happen between these membranes and this intermembrane space and the matrix here. So the first thing that's actually going to happen is pyruvate is going to enter. And as it enters, pyruvate goes in. It's actually going to be assisted, if you will, by an enzyme. And what's going to happen is CO2 is going to come off. And it now becomes acetylcoenzyme A. So I'll put it out here so you can read it. But I want you to just appreciate as pyruvate comes in, it becomes acetylcoenzyme A right here in that inner membrane space. So we now have acetylcoenzyme A. Now what? Now we enter the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle and TCA cycle. Once again, thank you so much, science, for calling the same same process three different names so there's a lot of detail here and I know I'm already going greater detail than the book I want you to appreciate that I'm not really even scratching the surface of the true detail here but I'm showing you this more detail uh, to uh, kind of give you a jump start uh, for future classes in anatomy and physiology and exercise physiology and to get you to appreciate the complexity here so what happens we can actually start if we look at this little um, diagram we actually start with pyruvate right here and we can say hey, oh here's that pyruvate dehydrogenase and so now we have acetylcoenzyme A so now we're inside the mitochondria at this point right here so think of this line being the 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 outer membrane of the mitochondria all right and so now everything from down here from here down is that inner membrane space so it's a series of reactions and a series of reactions is going to com continually oxidize this acetylcoenzyme A and what we're we going to do if we oxidize one thing we have to reduce something else and when we do something we're going to be getting those high energy molecules there's NADH NADH2 in this case they're going to call it you'll also hear it called NADH plus H plus same thing 
and also another one, FADH2. Same thing here. So we're getting these high. Notice there's more up here. In fact, we even gained one when we actually made this conversion to pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A. We also gained NADH2 up here. So remember, I mentioned before, with these NADH2s, we're eventually going to get out three ATPs. We're going to find out FAD, we're only going to get two. So actually, let's just kind of quickly kind of count some of this up. So we've got three here, another three here, another three here, and another three here. So I'm now counting one, two, three, four NADHs here, right? So that's 12 ATP plus another FADH, right? That's 14. But remember, wait a minute, for every one molecule of glucose, we actually created two pyruvates. So you see, well, we'd have to double all this and go through this again. So we'd actually end up not with 14 because of this process, ending up with this process, but actually 28. And also remember that we actually got NADH and some ATP directly from glycolysis. And we're going to find out we're actually going to get some ATP directly here as well. So if we looked at glycolysis, what was our real net if we were completely anaerobic? We only really netted two AP, ATP in, gly in glycolysis, right? That's what we saw before. We didn't really net a whole lot directly, all right? But now we're going to see that we're going to get a lot more by oxidizing the molecules completely. But once again, don't worry about the details. Right now, just notice the cycle. So what do you really need to appreciate? Once again, it's a, it's a cyclical cycle that occurs in the mitochondria. It produces lots of NADH, also ATP, also FADH. And then that NADH is actually used in the third stage, known as the electron transport chain, that we're going to get to in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and show you a little animation from the publisher that I think summarizes the Krebs cycle pretty well. During glycolysis, glucose is broken down to pyruvate. A two-carbon fragment of pyruvate is used to form acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondrion. During the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide, CO2, is produced and a molecule of NADH is formed. The two-carbon acetyl portion of the acetyl-CoA is transferred to a four-carbon molecule, producing a six-carbon compound. The COA carrier molecule is released. Carbon dioxide is then released from the six-carbon molecule, forming a five-carbon compound. In this step, hydrogen is removed and transferred to NAD plus to form NADH. Next, a second oxidation and decarboxylation occurs. Again, NADH and carbon dioxide are produced. In addition, a molecule of ATP is produced. As a result of these reactions, a four-carbon molecule is formed in the Krebs cycle. Finally, the four-carbon molecule is further oxidized and the hydrogens that are removed are used to form NADH and FADH2. These reactions regenerate the four-carbon molecule that initially reacts with acetyl-CoA. Each glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules during glycolysis. Then, each pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. Thus, for each glucose molecule, the Krebs cycle must complete two circuits to completely break down the two pyruvate molecules. Well, hopefully that helped you visualize it. And once again, that's more the big picture I need you to realize right now as far as the Krebs cycle, that we're going through this cycle in that intermembrane space. And it happens twice, and we're getting a whole bunch of those now reduced high-energy molecules, NADH and FADH. 
So now we have the electron transport chain, and this is actually happening in the inner, mit inner mitochondrial matrix. So this is where we actually get our bang for our buck. This is where we're actually going to produce ATP when high potential electrons, all right, are transferred to O2. Now, to maybe clarify some confusion, once again, I keep talking about electrons are the carrier of energy here. High potential electrons, high potential energy electrons. All right, but they're being carried with hydrogen. Specifically, remember hydrogen, if we usually say we see a hydrogen in a solution, it's usually H plus, just a proton by itself. But really it has that inner shell that could normally follow through uh, with, fill with two electrons. So in this case, it's not H plus here, but it's known as a hydride ion is H minus. So it has these two electrons with one proton. And those electrons right here, if you will, are actually where the energy is, is being stored. Um, but that, once again, a little extra detail, but I want to clarify that because I keep talking about high potential electrons, but you see hydrogens moving back and forth. That's why I wanted to clarify that. But where does this happen? Once again, this takes place here in that inner mitochondrial membrane right here. And we're going to see it's actually on the membrane itself we have specialized proteins that are going to be going across and we're going to create what's called a potential gradient of hydrogen this time it will be h plus and it's going to f force the hydrogens all to one side and so well we know it, we know about diffusion that if you have a high concentration in one area they're going to want to flow to the other well in order to get across that membrane to and because of that pull that flow it's going to have to go through a special protein it's called a hydrogen pump and that's where our ATP is made so the end products here are lots and lots of ATP that's what we're going for CO2 and water well, which makes sense here think about it this is the output this is our output our high energy molecule that we will use for things like muscle contraction and for making proteins and enzymes and for cell replication. Anytime we need energy, we use ATP. That's our output. Energy, CO2, and water. What was our input? What was our input? Well, it was our food. Our carbs. Right? Our fats. And our proteins. And what was that made primarily of? Oh yeah, carbon. What else is our in, what else is our input? Air, specifically O2. Right? We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out CO2. Where did the C come from? Oh yeah, from right here. The C in the CO2 you, that you breathe out is coming from your food, right? Those macromolecules. This is why we breathe and this is why we eat. So the electron transport chain, it's a series of molecules, once again, embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. I should mention that, inner, not just mitochondrial membrane. NADH is made, remember, in both steps one and two. In other words, when I say step one, it was made in glycolysis. And here, it's also made in the citric acid cycle, TCA cycle, as well as technically pyruvate decarboxylation. And they, and once again, NADH carries those electrons, those high potential electrons. In the end, for every one molecule of glucose, one glucose molecule that goes through this entire, entire way of generating energy, going th goes all the way through using oxygen through the electron transport chain, glycolysis, pyruvate decarboxylation, the citric acid cycle on now electron transport chain, you get 32 to 34 ATP. And then that varies on a couple of things as far as the specific enzymes, as well as if you're starting with glucose or if you're actually starting by chopping apart um, glycogen for energy. But we get 32 to th um, 34 ATP. Remember, if we 
we, were, we if we were anaerobic, one glucose molecule anaerobically using just glycolysis only nets us two ATP, right? And if if it's anaerobic, so you can see. Wait a minute. I want you to appreciate here that we've pretty much sucked as much energy as we can out of the single glucose molecule. And once again, what's required here? Oxygen, O2. That acts as that final electron acceptor in the chain. So once again, let's look at a little animation going over that. When glucose is oxidized during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD are reduced to NADH plus H plus and FADH2. In the mitochondria, the electrons from NADH plus H plus are transferred to the electron carrier proteins and the protons are transferred across the membrane. As the electrons move from cytochrome to cytochrome down the electron transport chain, more protons are carried across the membrane. Cytochrome C transfers electrons to the cytochrome C oxidase complex. Protons are also transferred to the outside of the membrane by the cytochrome C oxidase complex. The cytochrome oxidase complex then transfers electrons from cytochrome C to oxygen, the terminal electron acceptor, and water is formed as the product. The transfer of protons generates a proton motive force across the membrane of the mitochondrion. Since membranes are impermeable to ions, the protons that re-enter the matrix pass through special proton channel proteins called ATP synthase. The energy derived from the movement of these protons is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate. Formation of ATP by this mechanism is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. So remember, we started with glucose, which is really our main energy molecule, but of course we don't use just glucose. We can obviously use other carbohydrates that will actually enter in various ways into glycolysis or proteins or more likely lipids but for all intents and purposes proteins and lipids enter cellular respiration they can only be burned aerobically they can only be burned using oxygen so only carbohydrates only glucose blood sugar can be burned anaerobically without oxygen proteins and fats can only be burned aerobically which is really important for you to understand and so here's that scary looking picture again. And once again, crazy amount of detail here that you don't need to know, but I want you to appreciate it. And I want you to appreciate what you've already learned. Because at the core of this very confusing bio, uh, biochemical chart, it starts way up here and it's probably too hard to read, but right here is glucose. And this first part right here is all glycolysis getting to pyruvate and then crossing the membrane if we can see this different coloration here that actually represents the mitochondria going through here and creating acetyl coenzyme a oh and here is that citric acid cycle my point is you've learned a lot i don't want you to lose sight of the big picture realizing that we can gain our energy either anaerobically without air, without oxygen. Okay, without oxygen, but the only fuel source we're gonna get that way is glucose. And it's fast energy, but it's not very efficient, right? Or if we do have enough oxygen, we can gain it aerobically. And there we can continue using our carbohydrates But now we can also use our lipids, our fats, right, and our proteins as a fuel source of last resort. We don't want to waste um, our good old amino acids that we'd much rather use for building and repairing tissue and so forth um, to on fuel. We'd much rather use it for 
once again, making structural proteins, making enzymatic proteins, and, and making our little cellular machines. So hopefully um, this helped going a little deeper, and I think it will help once again as you move forward past this course when we move into exercise physiology as well as anatomy and physiology.